It's nice to see you all here. I'm Abby Wolf. I'm the executive director of the Hutchins Center, and it's a pleasure to see you for the second of Ben Vincent's Huggins lectures today. I unfortunately wasn't here yesterday, but I heard it was great, so I'm glad to see you here today, and I'm happy to be here today, too. So I just wanted to introduce you to Professor David Carrasco, the Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America in the Harvard Divinity School, who will, who will provide the introduction for Dean Vincent today. So thank you very much and enjoy. Well, thank you very much. It's um, a special pleasure and honor to be here to introduce to you Ben Vinson, who is both professor and dean. As a matter of fact, when you look over Professor Vinson's uh, curriculum vita, uh, you see somebody who's done some very heavy pulling in administration and also some very important, powerful research uh, and publications in scholarship. And you see this uh, uh, overriding deep concern for the quality of university life throughout his vita and throughout his work. Um, a graduate of Dartmouth College and also Columbia University where he got a doctor's degree in history. Um, he's gone on to distinguish himself at several universities, um, including Penn State University, Johns Hopkins, and now at George Washington University where he's dean at the Columbian Colleges of Arts and Sciences. And when you look and see what he's done there, it's extremely impressive, the kind of faculty, the numbers of faculty, departments, and individuals that he keeps an eye on, the way in which he has tried and successfully elevated that school's involvement in not only the arts, but in also the sciences and engineering, um, and his leadership in GW's attempt to raise a billion dollars for making history comprehensive funding raising campaign. Um, you can ask the question, well, how does he have time to do this kind of important research on a topic that is very dear to my heart, um, uh, which has to do with the Costas history of Mexico, where my family is from. Um, and um, uh, what you see in the three titles of these lectures that he's given us, yesterday's wayward mixture, the problem of race, tomorrow's the jungle of extreme mixtures, and today's Casta Genesis, uh, is somebody who is uh, trying to make an important contribution to complicating and enriching the way we think about race and race mixture uh, beyond the black-white categories that have so much controlled the way we think about ourselves in this country. So I'm very grateful for the kind of leadership and research that he's doing. And what we read uh, in terms of how he wants us to think about his work, we see the following. Before the advent of the 20th century, and the rise of one of the most influential ideologies ever devised to describe, manage, and account for the outcome of interracial contact, there existed a complex and imperfect system of racial management. Widely described as the Latin American caste system, this series of talks aims to chart how, in colonial times, racial mixture presented a problem of governance that demanded interesting solutions. The system of control was never complete, leading to a proliferation of unique racial groups that ultimately helped condition how modern mestizaje would emerge. Rooted in the study of colonial Mexico, this discussion of racial disturbances, origins, casta genesis, and racial consequences aspires to help bridge connections between a forgotten past and a palpable present. So please join me in welcoming Ben Vincent III to give today's lecture. Brother Ben. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, let, let me just thank you again. Um, the introductions that you guys give here, I mean, it's just, is this me? I don't even recognize this. Uh, but I, I, deeply appreciate, uh, I deeply appreciate this. And it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, this book has been a long time in the, in the making, uh, 14 years uh, almost to the day uh, from when this, uh, the seed of this 
project was born right here at, at Harvard University uh, in Bernard Balin seminar. And so having the chance to come back now nearing the completion of this project, and I've also, I, I see uh, uh, Linda Haywood and John Thornton, I had a chance to also test drive aspects of this conference uh, at, at their shop, uh, of, of, this, of this book at their shop. Um, uh, and so it's really an honor and a pleasure to be back here upon the near conclusion of this project. Um, yesterday was about setting the table. Uh, one of the things that I did, uh, I tried to accomplish yesterday, was to lay out the scene, the problems, the, the issues that were, uh, that were beguiling the administrative uh, apparatus of the colonial uh, Spanish-American regime. Uh, mixture started to happen early, and it started to, uh, to entangle uh, all, of the, uh, uh, all of the efforts uh, that the Spaniards uh, had in trying to manage and control their empire. Uh, and so uh, setting the table yesterday was about talking about the various strands uh, of, of, of ethnic and racial influences that had entered, uh, entered Latin America and particularly Mexico and how uh, those particular strands caused problems. They destabilized an order, uh, an order that was uh, aspired to early by, by the Spaniards in creating a dual republic system, uh, two spheres of individuals, um, Indians and Spaniards, and ne'er the, twa the twain shall meet. But the twain met often and frequently, and others were introduced into the mix, Africans, um, people from the Orient. Uh, and this is where I'd like to pick up today. Uh, today's uh, session will be a, a little bit different in flavor from yesterday. Um, the, the lectures are conceived of, again, in three parts. Um, a more kind of survey, which was yesterday. Today is a little bit more intellectual history, um, less images, uh, and hopefully uh, there, there's, some, there's some twists and turns here. I, I'll, I'll forewarn you. I hope, that, uh, I hope that they come across clearly. And tomorrow is about diving in, uh, looking at those extreme mixtures. Uh, who were these people, uh, and what did, the, what did it lead to? Uh, hopefully some of these answers will be satisfying. Hopefully they'll leave you with many questions uh, for, for continuing inquiry, and, uh, um, and perhaps discussion over dinner with some of you. The Latin American caste system, the urgent need for which I tried to describe yesterday, actually had mysterious origins that clouded its purpose, its practice and goals. As the colonial period slowly matured and as racial mixture in Spanish America generated more and more caste groups, numerous ways of expressing racial and social racial difference also started proliferating. Beginning with the earliest moments of the conquest and extending well into the 18th century, an array of ethno-religious classifications existed in the Spanish Empire. There were terms like moriscos, um, so literally meaning Moorish individuals, judíos, Jews, cristianos, uh, Christians, conversos, people who had, who had converted from Judaism to, to uh, Catholicism. There were also socioeconomic designations. The labrador, or the worker, the, the hidalgo, um, aligned to the nobility. Pechero, caballero, which is again, a, a caballero, more of a term for the nobility. There were geographic descriptors that flowered in this world. Vecino, meaning citizen. Criollo, someone born of the new world. Natural. All of these terms, no need to remember them all, but I'm trying to paint the scene. All of these terms had been circulating in Spain for ages, and they became gradually reinterpreted in Spain's colonial territories. Collectively, all of these terms, these methods of categorizing human difference, grew to be known in the 16th century in the Sp by Spanish bureaucrats and laypersons as describing generos de gente, and that literally means types of people. This term, flowering early in the 1500s, came to precede the widespread use of casta, the term of casta, caste. And this term, generos de gente, seen time and time again in the documentation throughout the 16th century to describe people who would later be described as mestizos, mulatos, negros, mestizos, mulatos as we know, mulatos and negros, blacks, etc. When caste formally entered the vocabulary of colonial Spanish-American society, what it meant at the beginning of the colonial period was rather different than what it would become over time. In its purest sense, 
the idea of caste, casta, as expressed in 16th and 17th century writings, especially on the Iberian Peninsula, referred to animal breeding and lineage. It emphasized taintless purity. Applied first to the world of animal husbandry and to the realm of, of the animal, caste later was used to describe human behavior, emphasizing practices of good breeding that favored legitimate birth and noble status. So the translation we should see early, the movement from caste to animal to caste to human was the trajectory. Then, it was, this was on the Iberian Peninsula, then the concept was transplanted into the Americas. And here, caste's meaning shifted somewhat, referring now to, offspring, to the offspring of individuals who were racially mixed. In fact, all racially mixed individuals, regardless of their hue, came to be known collectively as castas, or castes. Although the concept of caste continued to emphasize breeding and lineage in the New World, that original positive connotation that was associated with the term in the 16th century gradually started to fade. As colonial elites began viewing segments of this mixed race population with disdain, as they began assigning inferiority to certain phenotypes, caste was no longer clean, but corrupt. Some have su suggested that caste probably started gaining traction as a race-like term in the 1620s. But records have not emerged to prove this. There's even debate, and we all use this as historians. We're so guilty. Guilty as charged. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty as charged. There's even debate on which all these complex formulas, everything I showed you yesterday, the pictures you're seeing on the screen, all of this stuff, whatever even became really known as a caste system or a sistema de castas in the first place. I've never seen it discussed this way in any colonial document, uh, but it is certainly something that we, uh, that we, have, we, have, we discuss in common uh, in, 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 the, in the current day. Instead, what we see, rather than being rolled up into a tight, neat package, in well-known compilations of colonial laws and legislation governing racially mixed individuals, all of these laws and legislation tended to be scattered, almost atomized, throughout a vast, vast body of, of legal opinion and decrees that address specific issues confronting the colonies, such as arms use, taxes, public office holding, marital law, etc. So as these laws were rolled out, it became then fragmented or segmented into specific ways in which the caste fit into the law. Notably, while there were certainly laws governing mestizos, indios, Indians, negros, blacks, mestizos, mestizos, and mulatos, on the other hand, one seldom encountered targeted legislation carved out for the rarer castes. This is to say, when it, when it came to groups like the ones that I've been dedicating a lot of time studying, many of the groups in these pictures, the moriscos, those people that we know who are the mixture of mulatto uh, and white, the castizos, the, in, uh, the mixture of the Indian uh, with the mestizo, I'm sorry, the, the, the coyote, which is the Indian and mestizo, the castizo, the mixture of, uh, of, of a white and a mestizo, um, and lobos, these groups, colonial legal guidelines were murky. Sometimes these groups were singled out, and at other times their regulation fell under more general rubrics. Put another way, the extreme castes comprised a bit of a blind spot in colonial legal eyes. From what we know about the early days of the colonial caste system in Spanish America, it is not too wild to fathom that the earliest impetus for the design of caste-related laws probably first came from the colonies, with New World officials likely being the primary architects of any of these regulations around caste. Caste laws were not handed down first from the king or his court in Spain, and the reasoning here was simple. It was fairly common in this period for Spain to react to events in the Indies, resolving issues and matters as they happened. Equally customary was for the king to allow individual colonial governments to respond definitively to circumstances happening in their colonies. When matters were resolved through local channels, the decisions 
and the decrees that were issued in one province or colony could very well serve as a precedent for resolving similar incidents throughout the Indies. In short, as regional governors and administrators dealt independently with racially mixed groups in their settings, their activities and rulings slowly agglomerated into a body of legal precedent that became then the core guide to handling racially mixed groups. This was likely the birth of the reputed caste system. Some laws complemented one another. Other laws directly contradicted themselves. Sometimes there was legal redundancy. Sometimes laws were obeyed and enforced. At other times, there was widespread, widespread misinterpretation, abuse, or neglect of the law. The jumbled nature of caste regulation made things feel incoherent. But it's likely that coherence was never conceived as the end game. Lumbering up along, bit by bit, a collage of a system, a collage of a system of habits and practices began morphing alongside caste legislation, which was itself sometimes more of a compass towards how to behave and live than a direct instrument of control for colonial life. And to the best of our knowledge, what resembled a system started coalescing empire-wide around the middle of the 17th century. In the haze that surrounded the origins of caste policy, what does stand clear is that what later became known to the world and what we talk about as the caste system also reflected a complicated system of beliefs about the natural order of the world and how racial mixture both complicated and affirmed those notions. This is to say that understandings of caste were rooted in basic beliefs about religion, about society, and science. Because these ideas were constantly evolving, particularly in the realm of science, this produced an added fluidity in the concept of caste that would manifest itself over and over during the three centuries of colonial rule. The 16th century was probably one of the most elastic moments for how caste was conceptualized, since many of the castas or castes appearing in this period were new, since frameworks for assigning legal statuses to them were in their infancy. And ideas about how, how biological properties could impact human bodies were not as strongly planted in colonial mindsets as they would be in later periods. Underwriting some of this elasticity was the power of scientific and medical theories, especially the influence of early medieval and early modern interpretations of scientific claims made by two of antiquity's greatest medical thinkers, Galen and Hippocrates. Thanks to their pioneering work, individuals living in the Hispanic world at this time largely believed that human physiology, temperament, and character were malleable, being subject to a wide variety of external and internal influences. In order to maintain good health and a robust constitution, one had to achieve an overall balance of humors, which were appropriate to one's body type. The slide that you see is just a, a representation, a period representation of those humors. Humors were the four bodily fluids, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. These were believed to govern the body by expressing heat, wetness, cold, and dryness. Africans, Indians, and Europeans were thought to have different baseline humoral, ba humoral balances that in part accounted for their varied complexions and behavioral attributes. Significantly, humoral imbalance could be affected by a series of non-natural forces, such as food, climate, air, exercise, sleep, bloodletting, and menstruation, as well as emotions. A lot of this, uh, is, has been, this ground has been really well covered by uh, the historian Rebecca Earle. Um, and uh, I invite those of you who would like to learn more about this to, to read her, her fascinating work. Early science and medicine placed great emphasis on managing these variables and regulating overall health. This humoral thinking was prominent in the colonial period, and when construed alongside the early evolution of caste, it underwrote notions that the new populations that were appearing in the new world were inherently changeable. They were not automatically 
deterministically fixed. Ideas of science could not be divorced from religious beliefs, and during this period, the supremacy of Christian thought in Europe deeply impacted views towards body, towards caste, and general differences in physiology. In particular, monogenism, and that is again the notion that all humanity had Adam and Eve as their common ancestor. Monogenism made it heretical to conceive that different branches of human populations could, could exist with supposedly innate char characteristics passed down her hereditarily over time. It's a mouthful. Um, basically what I'm trying to say, monogenism basically said that, you know, you, that the, the common ancestry made it very difficult for different branches of, of humanity to exist that the traits were just kind of sent down from generation to generation. The belief in monogenism shaped conversations about human differences in ways that encouraged thinkers to affirm core elements of human commonality. So when seemingly permanent human differences were encountered in, in certain populations and they were considered transmissible through racial mixture, monogenism then placed a heavy burden of proof on the Bible for explaining these supposedly permanent differences. African skin color, uh, which was... Uh, which was hard to alter, it was hard to get rid of, it was thought to be a physical marker of a biblical curse, which further helped explain why black skin did not revert back to whiteness, which was oftentimes presumed as man's natural color when exposed to colder climates. With biblical undergirding, other features supposedly endemic to blacks were justified. Now this is where things uh, begin to get a little bit funny, and, and not in the humorous sense. Partly contradicting Hippocratic Galen, uh, Galenic theories, black bodies were considered less impacted by non-natural forces and the effects of humoral imbalances. So their personalities were considered more set, their bodies less pliant, their constitution less changeable than those of Spaniards. And these core ideas found home in the early mindset of caste in Spanish America, shaping opinions about mulatos and other blacks of mi mixed racial heritage who were considered to carry the traits of their African ancestors. Yet on the other hand, Africans arriving to the New World as well as their offspring were largely also considered old Christians, which is something we talked about a bit yesterday. As such, they were then incorporated into the gente de razón, people of reason status. And as gente de razón, they enjoyed a different legal position vis-a-vis -vis the native population in the early colonial world. Moving on to yet another factor that impacted the concept and expression of caste in the early colonial period. Another factor was the Iberian concern over maintaining blood purity, often discussed as limpieza de sangre. This was a specific preoccupation that Spaniards had, given their centuries of close contact with Muslims, as well as their efforts to contain the spread of Judaism. Between the 15th and early 16th centuries, moves to eradicate the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula, combined with something known as convivencia, which was basically a recognized coexistence of the three religious groups. This set the ground rules for a framework of thinking about hybridity that would ultimately take hold in the colonies. In Spain, as the 16th century gradually unfolded, what had been somewhat common practices of accepting Jews and Moors into genealogical bloodlines became increasingly seen as bearing negative consequences, since the supposed impurities of these faiths were then considered transmissible from parent to child. As limpieza de sangre evolved, it increasingly affirmed that clean Christian blood had to be guarded vigilantly. Rising to the challenge of this guardianship, the Spanish Inquisition and other Iberian institutions began intensifying their gatekeeping in the second half of the 16th century to better monitor and control heterodoxy. One result in Spain was the creation of a more calculated and genealogically rooted practice of measuring the precise degree to which religious converts to Christianity were either old or new Christians. The Inquisition began tabulating individuals as half Christian, quarter Christian, 
one eighth Christian, one sixteenth Christian, etc. Um, the more distant one's Jewish or Moorish ancestry, the more acceptable they were deemed. Uh, there's another excellent book on this by the, the late Maria Elena Martinez, uh, which really studies and drills down into to this limpieza de sangre phenomena. Now, taking these, these measurements, if you will, of, of Judaism and of, uh, of, uh, of Muslim uh, uh, contribution and constitution, when we turn back now to the New World, the ideas and principles that underwrote limpieza de sangre made the journey across the Atlantic. And the practice of categorizing individuals by fractions would become embedded into how caste would be articulated. When colonists and bureaucrats started wrestling with what it meant to be racially mixed, they began formulating a legal and social framework that borrowed from these ideas, la limpieza de sangre, that took into account what it meant to be a quarter Spanish. What did it mean to be a half Af African or one third Indian and the like? The categories quickly acquired names, and new hybrid populations started blossoming in the New World. Despite the literally infinite possibilities that were possible within the racial stock of the Spanish colonies, there were three main bloodlines that formed the core. Españoles, whites, indios, Indians, negros, morenos, blacks. These groupings, in turn, gave rise to a selection of frequently cited mixtures, the mestizos, white and Indian, the mulato, Pardos and Zambos, the mixture of black and Indian. Over time, Pardo eventually became synonymous with Mulato, thereby losing some of its indigenous referencing. A final category that was found at least with frequency in colonial Mexico was that of Castizo, which is the mixture of white and Mestizo. In addition to these core classifications, there were a plethora of other possible caste combinations. In Mexico, depending on the count, um, there are between 168 categories that some have been able to figure out. Um, I've found in, in the documentation 18 to 20 uh, f pretty faithfully encountered categories in, in various types of, of documentation. In general, uh, the specific, each specific Costa designation was governed by a logic that emphasized genealogical lineage. By knowing one's ancestors, one could supposedly calculate Costa. An Indian and an Espanol produced a mestizo. A mestizo and an espanol produced a castizo, and so forth. Now, another central idea that progressively influenced understandings of caste, and especially the effects of miscegenation, was something that racial mixture introduced. Was, was that racial in, mixture introduced something that was fundamentally unsettling into an ideal way of being? This is not really talked about much in the literature, but it's something that I think needs to be thrown into the, uh, to the mix. Mixed race people were often described en masse, en masse, as being of color quebrado. That means literally of broken color. This terminology not only helped fortify color as a force that distinguished populations, it also exposed a host of biases that began to percolate in colonial life. People of broken color were routinely and pejoratively referenced as having bad habits. They were considered innately superstitious, which was partly attributable to their poor upbringing. They were depicted as shiftless, as suspicious, as prone to lying under oath, untrustworthy, roundly unreliable. You see this time and time again in the documentation. Being quebrado, being broken, was equated with being born with an inescapable defect, as opposed to Espanoles who, by, who were described as being of good birth. For some, even just a dash of racial mixture discounted individuals from being considered amongst society's upper strata, regardless of their professional pedigree, regardless of their accomplishments. As the colonial period matured, one of the primary impacts of this quebrado or broken label was its destabilizing effect on the mestizo category, which was one of the mo most closely aligned to the revered Hispanic ideal, and whose members sometimes considered themselves above the rest, enabling them to lobby for special privileges, immunities, and exemptions. As the color quebrado terminology became more adopted in the colonies, 
its prioritization of phenotype, a form of colorism, sparked tension with genealogically driven appraisals of human qualities. And over time, colonists regularly either began combining genealogical human assessments that were anchored in limpieza de sangre with phenotypic descriptions, or they opted to favor one approach over the other at specific moments in time. I've walked us through some complicated history. I hope uh, I've tried to make this as digestible as possible. I, I hope I've succeeded to some extent. But let me, let me meander on in this sinuous conversation. Such were the fundamental concepts, the ideological frameworks and principles that underwrote what has become known as the Spanish colonial caste system. By way of recap, certain influences of early modern science, and it also includes astrology, which I kind of left out. Some, some influences of early modern science serve to highlight aspects of caste malleability, while also sustaining the ingrained mythos of white supremacy. Anchored in considerations of religious purity, limpieza de sangre, purity of blood, also affirmed the supreme value of whiteness, but added a lineage-based taxonomy to trace genealogical tra uh, to chase, trace genealogical change. As the colonial period matured, caste quite simply manifested itself to be an unstable idea. The more it was used, the more its explanatory power seemed to slip. And part of the problem also had to do with its cognates that started creeping into the ideological terrain of the early colonial period. Already by the 17th century, in a single document, a person could be simultaneously referred to by their nación, their nation, their calidad, their quality, clase, their class, condición, their condition, or their casta, caste. These things, just imagine these things being juggled in the air. So with these complex intellectual formation at the same time in actual the, the practice of everyday language. There were so many terms that were, it, it was like, you know, like static noise, right? You know, just stuff trying to compete with each other. When juxtaposed against one another, it grew harder and harder to differentiate between these various categories, since they could be used synonymously. In 1631, for instance, uh, Don Domingo Carvalho, a resident of Manila, which of course was part of the Spanish Empire, was involved in litigation against the slaves. Now, although the slaves believed that their bondage was temporary, Carvalho managed, maintained that all of his slaves were indebted to him for life, obviously. As a matter of procedure, each slave's caste was carefully recorded within the pages of the document. But implicitly, Carvalho's, Domingo Carvalho, the notaries, and apparently everyone else that was involved in the case understood that caste was being utilized as an, in identical ways as the term nación, nation. Etymologically, excuse me, derived from the term nacer, which was to be born. The word nacion frequently marked ethno-linguistic groups and individuals who shared common birthplace and culture. And this was precisely the meaning that was invoked here. Uh, caste had almost nothing to do with describing phenotype, nothing to do with describing lineage. Instead, it vir virtually mimicked our modern understandings of the concept of ethnicity. Confounding nación with caste was a legion practice, especially in descriptions that were applied to black slaves. In the 17th century especially, scores of African-born slaves were routinely described by both their casta and nación. Sometimes you find slaves being casta and nación Angola, casta and nación uh, Luanda, Mozambique, Congo, Biafra. Uh, all of these are uh, uh, indeterminately describing the same thing. I don't have the statistics here for you today, but uh, it is possible that a number, in fact, perhaps the vast majority of slaves hailing from Africa that at least entered parts of Mexico, at a minimum, were referenced in this way for about the first 50 to 75 years or so uh, and, uh, in, the, in the early slave trade. As in the Domingo Carvalho case in the Philippines, caste and nation uh, and nación, again, served essentially as synonyms for, for ethnicity. The practice of commingling casta and nación persisted for black, for black slaves uh, that were born in the New World, and even for free blacks who were born in Europe. Uh, it also persisted for uh, free blacks who were born in the Americas. So there, the, this, this confounding of these two categories persisted, but there was a twist when it started to apply to these other groups that were not from Africa. Let me explain. Rather than serving as a synonym for ethnicity, when applied to these non-African groups, 
both nation and casta, so nation and caste, tended uh, to markedly uh, categorize phenotype. Hence, when applied to these groups, the gravity of description shifted. Nacion moved closer to being an, an analog for caste rather than the reverse. A couple of examples help tell the tale. Uh, in 1661, the Spanish-born slave Pedro España from Cadiz uh, was listed as de nacion mulato. Uh, similarly, free colored such as Francisca Angela from the town of Puebla in 1604, or Juan Josef from San Agustin de las Cuevas, all of these individuals could be found listed as de, de nacion morisca, or de nacion lobo, uh, uh, literally of the, the nation lobo, or the nation morisca, uh, those caste terminologies. As easily as the concepts of nation and caste, nacion and caste, were used interchangeably, so too were other designations, such as calidad, quality, clase, class, raza, race, condición, condition. I'm not going to get into all of those for you today, but I just want to, again, project a scene for you. Uh, that A lot of these terms are, are being cooked in the same stew, uh, and people are borrowing them from time to time, uh, interchangeably. Now, the lines that were blurred between early conceptions of race, raza, and caste may be some of the most beguiling of all, and among some of the most troubling from the point of view of modern scholars, who have expressed grave concern that without carefully understanding each term's separate history, we run the risk of unjustifiably imposing modern ideas about race onto the colonial period. Now, there's some general consensus that there was a great overlap uh, between both of these terms, race and caste, uh, from the 15th century through the early moments of the colonial period, since both of these terms emerged from ruminations over lineage, nature, and breeding, with a particular emphasis on purity. This overlap continued for much of the 16th and early 17th centuries. However, a major disjuncture began occurring when race, raza, and caste started being applied to humans instead of animals. According to some, caste made, made the transfer more readily showing an aptitude for changeability. Rasa, or race, lingered as a term that applied more consistently to animals. When it finally made the transition to being described to humans, rasa connoted shame and marked infamy, closely resembling some contemporary uses of the Spanish words ila and nota. Especially in Spain, race, rasa, grew increasingly associated with describing religious lineage, specifically the heterodoxies that were implicit in Judaism and Islam. People who were Jews or Moors were considered to have mala rasa, bad race. This contrasted with individuals who were described as being of noble and clean casta, or caste. As rasa, or race, continued evolving along this track, caste took a different term, becoming ever less laden with ethno-religious overtones. Some have argued, nonetheless, that New World expressions of caste owed much to the foundation laid by new manifestations of rasa. What happened next was a matter of great scholarly contention. It's possible that distinctions that were put in place by rasa, demarcating Moors and Jews from Christians, and setting up discriminatory practices around them, were crucial steps towards framing modern notions of race and racism. Others would argue strongly against this view. However one chooses to decipher what happened during this period, in terms of how the categories of casta and rasa were utilized and they overlapped, regardless of how you view it, I think a clear chronology can be crafted. Starting from being relatively coterminous in the 15th and 16th centuries, there grew a moment of divergence in meaning as rasa became more associated with religious lineage and as casta arrived to the new world and became adapted to local conditions and demographies. While never absolute, some degree of conceptual distance between both terms lasted for about a century. And by the 1700s, the terms began melding again. The re reduced zeal in trying to excise Judaism and Islamic heresies combined with the circulation of new racial ideas from other parts of Europe and parts of the New World, all of this had an impact. And in 1726, uh, the famous dictionary of the Real Academia Española uh, defined race as 
the caste or quality of one's lineage. The lack of hard rules, however, one of the things that I'm trying to impart through this, through this discussion, the lack of hard rules to anchor the idea of caste or to regulate its practices is one of the reasons why some scholars believe that an explicitly and defined or, or regulated caste system never materialized in Spanish America. The amorphousness of caste is something also, is partly why scholars have hotly debated whether either class or caste influences were more important in determining the general shape of social relations in the colonies. A vast literature exists describing how people moved in and out of caste categories, mainly by applying the instruments of class and status to provide access up and down the social scale. You'll read about this if you read through the literature. I mean, especially in the 70s and 80s, it's something that's talked about over and over and over again, um, almost to ad nauseum, if, if you will. And equally intriguing literature explores how law became inscribed into caste status, enabling hops across the social hierarchy. Interestingly, however, as an inherently organic category that was subject to great fluidity, the concept of caste could live, it could stretch, and it could grow. This point, which has often been identified as a weakness of caste, actually, I think, might have been one of its strengths. Caste's prolonged elasticity enabled it to survive as an idea and eventually blend with the modern concept of race as it started to take root in the Hispanic world in the 18th and 19th centuries. Race as that more recognizable concept uh, that, we, uh, that we moderns uh, understand it to be. In the process, caste may have been a conduit through which older notions of social differentiation were incubated, refined, recoded, and transmitted, finding expression into contemporary manifestations of race in Latin America. As the concept of caste evolved between the 16th and early 19th centuries, it also may have ultimately emerged as a prime candidate and also a channel for transmitting the colonial period's multi-descriptional socio-racial systems into a more singular system, one that was framed within the ideology of mestizaje. Caste, however, performed different ideological work than mestizaje would in later times. Both took racial mixture as a basic reality of life and a fundamental starting point for the construction of society. At heart, however, caste attempted to demarcate and accentuate differences between people in hope that this would bring a better social order. Mestizaje placed greater emphasis on sameness and hybridity in order to engineer order and unity. Caste was fundamentally an imperial project, absorbed within conversations about the functioning of empire. With this in mind, Spain, Spanishness, and to some extent, early concepts of whiteness were unabashedly extolled, despite all three notions being incompletely formulated and understood even in Europe. Mestizaje, on the other hand, operated within the context of a nation state and sought to derive meaning from Latin America's own internal rather than imperial experiences. Mestizaje, aimed at fulfilling its nationalistic mission, ultimately existed to embrace racial mixture, situating uh, racial mixture in ways that would reveal miscegenation's own inherent value. Now, while I've described these two different tracks, mestizaje and caste, they were not necessarily immutable concepts. And a number of years ago, two historians, Joseph Sanchez and another Robert Jackson, introduced a term that raised little scholarly attention at the time when they, when they brought it up, but which seems appropriate for establishing conceptual connections between mestizaje and caste, casta. They suggested that we should label the tremendous fluidity that took place among casta groups as castizaje. Jackson further uh, juxtaposed castizaje against mestizaje, contending that while mestizaje served as a platform for generating social mobility in Latin America, castizaje was a concept that helped colonials move beyond the framework of race as they understood it. 
So I, I want to take this term because I think there's something to it. I, I think they left it pretty much on the table. And um, from my survey of the literature, very, very few people have actually taken this, taken this anywhere. Um, so uh, I want to pick, pick this up because I think it, it, it has some value to it. Exploring this concept of castisaje from yet another angle demonstrates its possible utility as a vital link in the evolution of mestizaje. If we envision castizaje as a framework that encompassed all forms of casta mobility, then it is possible to conceive of castizaje as a stage along the route to mestizaje. By caste mobility, what I'm talking about in, in, in Castisaje, I mean to say miscegenation, which fostered a type of intergenerational mobility amongst the castas, but as well as all of those various legal and social and cultural methods by, with, by which different caste groups altered their status, the mechanisms by which mestizos and mulatos became wider, or how indios became mestizos. In the literature, a lot of this has been talked about as passing. Um, but for a variety of reasons, I think there was more going on, more than just passing. I believe that, yes, passing was one strategy, one motion, uh, but also I believe that people in the colonial period, um, some individuals, especially at the extremes, lived, lived plural lives, that they, they were known by, by multiple, multiple castes, uh, either simultaneously or seriously over time, or serially over time. But if we package all this up, and if we if we think about everything that I've been trying to talk about, these, these unsettled, this unsettled nature of, uh, of the term casta, how it existed in this cacophony of, of terminologies, uh, how it was uh, created on these, on, these, uh, on, on frameworks that, them, that were themselves very complex uh, and, and, and contributing to a deep uh, intersectional formation of, of the term. Uh, not, what, I'm, what I'm trying to convey to you is what Alejandro was, was testing me on yesterday, that, you know, I think that, that this stuff is not, should not be seen as destabilizing, but it's actually part of a process. And if we think about it in, in the round, rather than dissecting and elementing uh, out parts of these pieces, uh, when we think about it in the round and packages, package it as castizaje, we arrive at something new. This afternoon, what I want to stress here and now is that it is possible that rewriting the historian's script to prioritize this castizaje, its cornucopia of motion, we can now move beyond spending inordinate time and effort discussing the reputed crisis, the reputed limitations of caste that have long, show, that long been showcased in various debates amongst historians and sub-debates and one-on-one and -on -one feuds that historians have engaged in, uh, especially the, the, the caste class debate, which is something that has occupied an uh, inordinate amount of time amongst historians, which I've actually also dedicated a good portion of my own career um, uh, involved in. So undoubtedly, the debilities and the well-documented in inability of caste to manage itself certainly produce shocks. It certainly produced commotion in the general colonial order. That's a, you can't doubt that. But ironically, what was most impacted by these developments was probably not a caste system per se. Okay? Not a caste. There wasn't even, people didn't even talk about caste system in those terms. Consider instead the possibility that it was castizaje that was most effective with the shocks to castizaje being primarily generative rather than degenerative in nature. Recall, caste as a concept was fluid, malleable, even shock absorbent. It could accommodate adjustments, all of the stuff that I've been talking about, jumblings and uh, uh, synonyms, uh, caste survived. Almost as soon as caste categories were employed in the colonies, they caused confusion. Dare I say that this was common throughout the colonies. Colonial administrators bemoaned the proliferation of castes. Some did not even know by which standards they should classify people. Newly arrived administrators in remote posts of the empire struggled with basic categorizations and pondered the extent to which they needed to impose caste standards or even adhere to local customs. This environment probably encouraged the convolution of terminologies. The confabulation of caste, calidad, no, nación, clase, with other cognates. Yes, it happened. But the cumulative effect was interesting. Let me posit that these tensions in, in the supposed, supposed system never broke down again, something that never existed in the first place. Caste was never an idea on solid ground. Few contemporaries dare describe caste networks as, as a functioning system. <laughs> What likely happened was that as the various shocks worked themselves through the caste hierarchy, the imperial government, the church, 
and local society. What happened as these things move through these various, these various theaters of power is that they actually loosened the notion of caste even more to the point where it became virtually coterminous with mixture itself. Seen another way then, castizaje, that process by which caste groups shifted, transformed, moved, and intermingled with one another, helped push the concept of caste past being simply a segmenting, segmenting force, but a concept then that captured the spirit of colonial plurality, the spirit of hybridity in its fullest sense. It was not uncommon to find census documents, government memos, tribute and parish records, traveler's accounts, treatises, and other forms of memoranda in which hybrid peoples were referred to commonly, as I mentioned earlier, as castas collectively. Increasingly in the 18th century, as the technologies of printing steadily advanced and as typeface fonts from imperial presses generated formulaic government forms with prefabricated categories of caste stenciled in ink, the process of compacting castes into more generic blanket categories accelerated. With these factors at play, it is no surprise that even into the 19th century, Agglomerations of people who were of mixed race continued to be known as castes, castas, in certain settings. One cannot underestimate the long-term value of this conceptual leap, at least in my view. Caste, in being able to personify all of colonial racial mixture, prefigured the essence of what lo mestizo would become generations later, what the mestizo essence of, of Latin American identity would become, what mestizaje, would, uh, would promote. However, even as the term caste settled into this new, more encompassing meaning in the colonial period, it never lost its other functions, its other meanings. Casta could still be called upon to carve any colonial population into minced groups, almost infinitely so. The finest mincing took place at the regional and local levels, where knowledge about neighbors and family were more prevalent and where officials were closer to events on the ground. At the vice-regal and imperial levels, the highest of the high, there was more remove. Bureaucrats ensconced here need not penetrate too deeply. In the final analysis by the end of the colonial period, and in fact well before, caste revealed itself to be a Janus-faced figure, simultaneously able to look at broad and wide at the social racial condition of society on the one side, while then looking microscopically at levels of detail and difference on the other. These abilities augured well for caste to be able to function operably in colonial settings, while also being able to synthesize the multiple strands of socio-racial classification throughout the empire for later use by Latin America's nations. Before mestizaje existed casta, morphing through the vessel of change called castizaje. Thank you. So uh, again, I, I did preview that, that there might that be a little bit of entanglement, uh, entangled uh, conversation. I hope I hope it came across. I hope some of the ideas uh, were imparted. Um, there's a lot that that I did leave out, but uh, uh, certainly uh, um, I think the essence of of, of the ideas are there. Uh, I think there's some there's time for questions. If uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions, yes. And if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself uh, before asking. Thank you, Ben. I'm Suraj. I'm with the Department of African and African American Studies. Uh, I'm also deeply interested in the issues of caste, but I try to understand it through the South Asian context. And uh, and whatever you have described, uh, it 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 almost resonates uh, to the writings in South Asia. Uh, of the caste, and, and one of the thing, uh, uh, the, the racial component of caste, and, and which you have uh, explored. Uh, although it appears that uh, it, it, uh, in, in Latin American context, it came in the 16th century, uh, with the advent of colonialism. However, there is uh, an existing uh, argument in India as well, uh, cast, casta, the, the emergence of, it's a Portuguese kind of invention. And, and however, the system kind of continues uh, due to this, this hermeneutic practices that are being uh, in, in, in the very Hindu law. Um, um, metaphors like, the, you know, miscegenation, purity of blood, and it kind of centers this whole around women as an, as an object uh, that transposes caste. Uh, one question to ask 
would be uh, how much of this is related in context of endogamy and exogamy practiced in maintaining that caste purity. Uh, second, what is the condition of caste today? How do we see it? Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, and pardon me for deriving this references from India, because uh, that, that's, uh, but uh, the metaphor, metamorphosis of religion example, it was an advent of Hinduism and then it kind of transposed into other religions and they hold. So caste eventually became a cultural phenomena that was reproducing itself. Uh, how much of that is, is visible? And final, uh, how do we, so when we understand caste as a subjectivity, uh, how do we understand a subjectivity of non-caste being a person who is non-casteified, if I may use that word, uh, and what is the situation? Of course, it's, it's a racial, maybe white, or maybe you could put more. Thanks. Okay, I think you've asked like 10 questions. Uh, <laughs> I, I will do my very best, uh, and there's some fantastic questions packed in there. Let me, let me try to first deal with uh, caste and non-caste. Um, what's interesting, and, and it's also connected with this notion of vermin. Um, so um, and, there, there are two things that are happening, at least in, in colonial Latin American and colonial Mexican, colonial Mexican case that, that, that I know best. Now, um, you know, everyone at some point, just by, by having a label, is somehow situated right, in, within a caste framework. So even the Espanol is, is referenced, even that's the ideal, right, uh, is, is somehow indexable within, within, a, within a caste uh, rubric. Um, but what, what happens is that the weight of, of, the, of casta, right, the, the weight of the meaning of that, of that term, even though everyone is within some architecture, caste architecture, um, uh, even though everyone is within it, those who are racially mixed are the ones who, who, who bear, the, bear the brunt. Um, and so, uh, and, and the, the vermin, if you will, is the fact of mixture. Um, is the fact of of, uh, of 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 interracial mixture because it dis it destabilizes um, uh, the order that the Spaniards in a very early period were trying to maintain the separation that the Spaniards were trying to maintain uh, for a variety of reasons some of it administrative convenience um, so uh, so this idea that that uh, the, in, I, I would believe that everyone in the colonial, uh, at least in the colonial Mexico and other, this could be true in other cases, every, everyone is somehow touched. Um, uh, no one, no one is, can truly uh, escape, but that what happens is that people, some, certain people feel it more than others. Um, and so that's, that's one, and I'm, I, I beg you to follow up because that, that gets at half of what you were getting at in that particular question. The second thing that's interesting is the, is the aftermath story. And it's something that I do take up in, in one chapter of this project. And that is kind of the, the echo effect. What does it mean today? You know, caste, let's, as soon as the colonial period is over, caste continues in, as an operating language for about a century, uh, which coincides nicely with the birth of mestizaje, which is, um, mestizaje itself was a term that was competing amongst, amongst other, terminolo other terminologies. One is mestiz mestizion, uh, which is something that, that was appearing in the late 19th century. Um, uh, other terms as well, um, hybridism and things of this nature. Uh, but caste continues, and it, uh, and it begins to occupy a very different type of history, um, in that it becomes seen as a relic of the colonial era. Um, and so it starts being used in, in, uh, in intellectual discourse and even in common discourse in a very interesting way uh, in that it's, it, it, nations begin to try to move beyond caste uh, uh, and, and, and saying caste is a figment of a past. Um, uh, and so this is something that's seen deeply in, in, in a lot of the writings uh, of, of intellectuals, at least in Mexico, that I've had a chance to read. But at the same time, Caste can be wheeled out uh, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, there, these caste terminologies were said to be uh, were abolished uh, uh, in 1821 in Mexico. You're not supposed to use them. In, uh, uh, in reality, when you look into, in the record, especially in church records, they continue to be used into the 1860s. Uh, and so uh, um, there are a variety of reasons for that, but the parishes found it convenient to continue to use these, these terminologies. You find it uh, used uh, in, um, in the, the common language of, of individuals uh, that persist to this day 
if you uh, travel to the western parts of Mexico, a place called the Costa Chica, which is an area uh, that can today has a large number of Afro descendants um, that have that, that go back to uh, colonial times, you'll find the, uh, the the utilization of a number of terminologies uh, that I still have not figured out all of them. Uh, there's something called the Negro Papayaste, uh, which uh, means essentially a rough looking black. Um, and there's the, uh, along with that is the Negro Crudo, uh, Negro Fino, Negro Claro. Uh, all of these are terms that you know, those of who travel to Costa Chica, you're familiar with these. So the, the stuff slips, right? It never, it's never really really gone, even with the pre pre with a predominant and, and homogenizing and, and very powerful influential ideology of mestizaje, you will find people saying, first, si, soy mexicano, mira, I'm not Mexican, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, you'll be talking to someone and they say, ah, mira, mira ese negro, negro fino, negro claro, eh, por allá, y anda por ahí. You know, uh, so look, at that, look at that black, fine black walking over there, etc. There, it's a way in which you know, the, the, the embers, if you will, the filaments uh, persist in, in a very local level uh, through time. Uh, I would argue there's some, there's some connections there, um, especially if you explore where, the, where these regions are, where they were historically within, within the colonial framework. Um, uh, but uh, so the story continues. It, the caste, caste system does, does, I mean, caste does not exist anything like, like in India. Well, let's, let's, be, let's be real. Um, it started fluid day one in, 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 in the colonial Latin American context. And that's that's a tremendous difference. So exogamy and endogamy, uh, those are those are as I mentioned in the talk, those are kind of compass points. That's what you're trying to achieve, quote unquote. You're not going to get there. Uh, and so that's that's kind of where where we are here. Um, and so even the español, the español puro, right? Uh, the, the 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 true Spaniard, unless they're fresh. Uh, from from Europe, there's there's something going on uh, deep into the colonial period. Those Creole Spaniards, um, there, there's some there's something. I I get in in the closet, right? There's some there's somebody in the there, in the closet, uh, and, and this this is something that circulates from time. And there's some plays that that that, that show this a uh, number of plays in which colleagues like Lona Katz, who's probably one of the great historians of the cast paintings, uh, has 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 recently talked to me about. Um, but it, or mentioned to me at least. Um, so hopefully that begins to get at some of what you're getting at. Your, your, your question is super complex, uh, and and uh, that, that begins. I don't know if you'd like to follow up before Laura is it. Um, would you like to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I was trying to also uh, think about theory of caste, which is degradation, you know, at its best. And obviously, your narrative uh, suggests that it was degrading uh, uh, social st stigmatization, um, and that's how it evolves. But when, then we have this Marxist interpretations uh, where people, well, uh, uh, the essence of caste uh, is has been taken aback as a as a labor uh, laborized phenomena where. Uh, it was colonial construct because the less productives were considered uh, the, the the low caste people who were not fertile enough for the colonial exploits. Uh, that's one argument. Um, but we have someone like Ambedkar, uh, a Colum uh, alumnus of Colombia. He, he he's trying to uh, go deep and he's, he's challenging the colonial definitions of caste, uh, which is uh, uh, less racial. Um, more an embedded phenomena within the ethnicized communities of itself. Uh, clearly, uh, Mexico, or, or uh, it, it's, it's a different uh, uh, sizable thing. But I think the labor concept, do you think it is something like that that Marxists suggest, or uh, it is shallow at one point? Yeah, I don't know if that, that really fits in, 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 the, in the cases that I, that I see in quite, in quite the same way. Um, yeah, that's. That, does, that's, that, that shoe doesn't fit well in, 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 in the examples that I have. Um, you know, many of the cast are some of the most productive members of society, uh, for, for one, um, in terms of the raw you know, labor force, uh, so to speak. But um, some, some castas are plutocrats. I mean, you look at the castizos. Um, some of those are some of your wealthiest people in Mexico. Uh, it, it, defies that, it defies that type of categorization. Um, well, anyway, yes, there are other, many other questions uh, I think. 
Um, ben, yes. so another wonderful lecture. Um, I think you're onto something in the connection between castas towards the late colonial period and mestizaje. But a couple of questions about this first. So if we, if we start thinking about mestizaje, not only as an ideology, you know, as, an, as, a, as a national project, but as a, as a process that has, in fact, these roots in colonial society, how does that change how we think about that? And if we, instead of looking forward, sort of look backwards, you know, by, by, the, by the late colonial period, this designation of castas as, as people of mixed descent acquires this flavor of pueblo, right? It's the, it's the, it's the popular sector. Uh, the castas are, is, is used to, to, as a contrast with elite. Mm -hmm. So it acquires this uh, kind of uh, inclusiveness. You know, this is a category of exclusion, as you have eloquently discussed here. But in this sense, it, be, it, it, it is transformed into a category of inclusion that has political and uh, possibilities that we would have to explore as well, don't we? I absolutely agree. And I was trying to get at that perhaps you know, for the purposes of the lecture, maybe a little bit more convoluted than, than you just articulated. But yes, I essentially agree with you. I do believe Casta became this, the pueblo uh, and became identified in the pueblo and as the pueblo. I believe that that, op, that particular meaning also had a more operational value in the independence period itself. Um, I think that as the colonies become free, and in Mexico is my test case, as that happens, that, that the, because Casta was so tightly associated with co colonial rule, it loses some of that capacity um, and to, to kind of continue as an expression of, of, the, of, of the pueblo, so to, so to speak, uh, of, of the common man. Uh, but it is sometimes deployed and redeployed in that way um, uh, in, in, in the writings of, of intellectuals in, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I also agree that, um, or I also would like to throw in there, is that as this term casta begins to stretch, as I mentioned, as it begins to grow and become more capacious in its, in its meaning, uh, in its, in one of the possible meanings, it, it, it serves even in, in, its, in its broadest sense and in its most micro sense as instruments of, of government, instruments of, of, of rule, um, as at the same time as, as, as it's serving as a identity mechanism for, for individuals of, of, of the communities of, of Mexico, and particularly um, in the period of independence, you, you've got uh, uh, unions between natives and mulatos and other peoples of mixed race who are coming together to fight for independence and, and, and see uh, and see casta as a, as, a, as, a meaningful, uh, as a meaningful descriptor for themselves. Um, so, uh, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, and uh, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm adding much to it, but uh, but I definitely think it's a way it's a way to think about it. The other thing that you you say is that when you look backwards, you know, mestizaje is not just ideology, but it's process. Um, for the purposes of this particular work, I am focusing on the ideological aspect of it. But truly, yes, truly, mestizaje is in fact the act of. Uh, the union and fusion of, of, of populations that, uh, that is, if anything, um, the same thing as, as what's happening with, with castas and, and castizaje. So um, I hope, does that, does that you, know, well, you might want to take me up with more on dinner with this, but uh, certainly, yes, other questions? Hi, I'm uh, Katie Sampak, and I'm a visiting scholar at the David Rockefeller Center. And I have a, a couple of questions. Um, and I'll make them brief, and then you take them where, um, where you feel like. But I'm especially interested in um, two issues. One, uh, gender, and how gender intersects with um, both the ascription and the experience and the pro proclamation of uh, Casta. And then also the, the status of Ladino, and how being a Ladino cha may change over time, and, and how that intersects with the Castas. So let me, if, if you don't mind me asking, your, your meaning of Ladino, if I can invite you to. Well, that changes. <laughs> so so I, I'm interested, especially in the case of Mexico, whether, so in, uh, it's often defined as um, someone of indigenous origin uh, taking, um, taking on Spanish um, cultural practices. 
Um, it, very early on, it's also assigned to um, sub-Saharan Africans who are Christianized and, and, and coming to the Americas. So is, is there one of those you want me to talk about in particular, or is it, yeah? <laughs> so the element of, of gender, I mean, it, it is so elemental to the story. Um, uh, it goes without saying that the sight of, of mixture itself, uh, and, and in fact, the birth of, mest of, of these categories happens. Um, uh, I mean, it, it happens because of these, these relationships that in deeply involve women and deeply involve the hearth and upbringing and things of this nature. Um, it, is, it is an elemental piece of the puzzle. Um, how, that, how that factors in, into the readings that I'm putting on it, um, in, this particular, in this particular discussion, I am trying to look at, at the categories. Uh, and I have, not, I have not performed that type of analysis. Uh, uh, so I can't, I can't explicitly uh, comment on, on that. Um, uh, in other areas where I start looking at extreme costas, that becomes, it's actually, it lends itself to that, that level of, of analysis. Um, in terms of the, the, the evolution, is the question the evolution of the term Ladino? Yeah, and how it intersects with yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, the way I see it is it's part of being able to, to kind of toggle on and off between your identities. It's part of that motion of castizaje that, 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 I'm, I try, that I'm trying to describe. I'm trying to get away, if you will, um, we've done a lot of work as historians on discrete aspects of the, pe of the puzzle. Um, what I'm trying to do here is acknowledge the complexities and then to say, you know what, let's, let's, fit, let's roll it up. And so I would, I would categorize all of the, the different switches and codes and the types of movement that happen and the shift even in the term of, of Ladino as part of this greater process of, of, of castizaje or mobility that just that needs to be acknowledged. Um, and so I don't know if that's completely satisfying to you, but uh, it's, it's, it's actually what I'm, what I'm intentionally trying to do. Um, you know, I, for one, have been, you know, I've been fixated for a lot of my career on, on some of these, these very specific categories um, in, and, and what, what's possible within, within them. Um, but I, Ultimately, that work left me asking a lot of questions that, uh, that has led me to this particular route. Um, so that's how I would answer that. And, and it doesn't illuminate at all um, Ladino for you. And, and I, actually, that's, that's part of what, I, what, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I'm actually trying to do. Um, so <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, for a really provocative discussion of Castizaje. I'm Ibrahim Sundiata from Brandeis University. I'm an Africanist. And my question is the last, it's a question for tomorrow, but I may not be here. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of trick question. But the question is, did Mestizaje ever occur? Did it ever really happen? <laughs> and the reason I ask that is, in the United States, within these borders, the term Mestizo is not the preferred term for Mexican immigrants or Mexican Americans. Uh, it's the one, one of the few countries in the Americas where me mestizo is not in use. I would rarely call an individual on the hoof mestizo. I would use another term, even Chicano, but never mestizo. I tried it about five times. I saw <laughs> So if there are no mestizos socially, um, then mestizaje becomes a kind of foggy concept. You said just, you mentioned, you know, yo soy mexicano. And that's a response that one of my colleagues at Berkeley gets more than, he gets many things, Chicano, uh, Lat Latino, etc., Mexicano, but never mestizo. And if you take away the idea of the mestizo, then you, did you really ever have mixture? Or you end up with the idea that Latinos or Chicanos are an autochthonous group that pops up and you erase all this wonderful history, if you see what I mean. You press a button and you say, sort of, we were there, Mexicanos, without this very rich cake that you've given us. So that was my question for tomorrow today. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna, I prefer to answer that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. That, that's tough. Yeah. And you say you're from the philosophy department? Or is it, uh, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> 
wow, that, that's, a deep, that's, that's a question I've, I've never thought about in, in quite the, that way. Um, you know, I've taken mestizo as a bit of a given, um, uh, but I hear what you're saying. Um, and and when, you, when you shift context, you, know, you, erase, you erase that in an instant. Um, and what does that then mean? Um, wow, I, 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 have, I, have, I have no answer for that one right, right at this time. I, I'm not even going to take a stab at that one. Yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll answer that for Alejandro tomorrow, yeah. But survey after survey, people do show people Yes, they do. Yeah. In Mexico. But what he's saying is, I think what you're saying is that when, you tra when that travels, you, that, you can, that, that actually can vanish. I mean, that, is that, that's what I'm hearing you say? No, I mean, there's no. Okay. like Edward Pettis at Princeton, there's mm -hmm. you know, a discussion of how Mexican-Americans see themselves, yep. which is somewhat different than in Mexico. So that in the United States, the term mestizo is really not used in social discourse, or in the law, or in the census, or anywhere else. Right. It's not a term. So one can be a mestizo in Chihuahua, mm -hmm. and then move to Houston, and one is, his, let's say, Latino-Hispanic. And you can move back and become again mestizo. Yes, 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 yes. But in this country, it's a term that supposedly has a negative tinge, and I don't know. I haven't looked at all the data, hmm. but I w I've learned not to say that to people on the hoof. <laughs> 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 I, I, points well taken. I, I, I just don't. I don't have an answer at this at this particular time. Um, Linda, yeah. thanks very much. I am thinking of sort of how does this the discussion. Well, I'm Linda Hayward. How does the discussion of Mestija uh, sort of um, reflect in the culture then? Because if you have categories in terms of people, race, they produce something and they live in a world uh, that, is, uh, that, that has a culture. So what, what did the intellectuals who were sort of writing and reflecting on this world uh, say about the culture? Because I, I was just, I'm asking this because I'm wrestling with uh, some, some sort of a re primary source readings I'm doing on Angola in the 18th century, 17th century. And here I see them condemning, you know, whites, brancos, for, for you know, uh, being sorcerers and, and doing all these, you know, um, um, African religions and participating, dancing, all this sort of thing. And I'm saying, that's a, that's a world of a real, where you have, I've, I've talked about, you know, Portuguese into African. Portuguese becoming African because they don't have the numbers to in fact impose that. This is not the case with Mexico. So I, I, can you reflect on that? What, the, what is the culture then? How, how is that notion legally imposed on culture? Could they, did, could, could they impose it or culture works in a very different way? Yes, and it's a great question. It's one that I've, I've also wrestled with. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. These, these categories did not map well onto culture. Um, and that's, that's, that's probably the easiest way to explain that. Um, uh, and uh, what, what you could find is within any category, multiple, multiple inconsistent and competing cultural practices. Um, and, and so... Um, that, that's, that's probably, that's, that's, the, that's the deeper reality. Um, what can be said is there's a general tilt for all of these groups to be a bit more Hispanicized. I mean, that's, that's the tilt. But within that, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and uh, um, there's a general tilt as you get into uh, categories like Morisco. Uh, you, can, you can parse this out a little bit. I mean. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm trying to do what I said I didn't want to do uh, for Catherine, but when you do parse it out, um, you get things like lobos tend to be a, a little bit more aligned to the native world. Moriscos tend to be uh, a little bit more aligned to the Hispanic ideal. Uh, mulato could go anyway. I mean, mulato, you could, you, could, you could be almost anything there. Um, uh, and then there are a number of other categories like I'll be talking about tomorrow, like a, um, the Rayado and some others, where they tended to be far more, uh, you could see African concoctions, not necessarily, um, I know that both of your work have, has, has, been, uh, has helped us to understand the deeper connections and transmissions, um, but in some ways, some of these groups 
were prisms for, for cultural expressions that, uh, that were themselves hybrid or that brought together various strands. Um, uh, and so th those are things that we see operating on the ground. But uh, um, the, you could not associate any one group with any, anything in particular. Um, and and that's, that's just how that, that's how that landscape operated. Yeah. We have time for one more. Oh, one last, Tom. Uh, I'm Tom Johnson from UMass Boston and Bentley. I wanted to follow up on what Ibrahim says. And I, I, as you began speaking, I recognize very well what you were talking about, is that you can talk about mestizo, mestizos, mestizaje, south of the Rio Grande. But if you go north of there, you got to jump all the way up to Canada, where they're talking about it again. And you, but they use the term Métis from French the, for the Red River uh, people and so forth. So it seems like mestizo, mestizaje travels well in certain areas and not others. It once came up in a discussion of, uh, of uh, Cape Colored people and the Cot River co settlement in South Africa, where I applied, said, well, let, let's, could we think about this in terms of mestizaje? And the, and the African has said, well, no, not really. Well, you can't take a term from Latin America and dr plunk it down here. And I think you can if you want to be a bit analytical about it. But the way I heard your, you f speaking is uh, whether or not the que Leopold von Ranke's question can apply here. What actually happened in history? Is there a, a definition and a process of mestizaje that we can define and describe objectively? apart from the formulations of early 20th century intellectuals, scholars now, cultural activists, and so forth, and that's so forth. And that's where I think it gets complicated. And we're going to have to listen to you tomorrow for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I'll, report to you if you're not here. Yeah, I'll try to bring ultimate clarity tomorrow on <laughs> all of these. But you know, look, it's just the reminder, of course, obviously, is that you know, we are the outlier in the United States. I mean, most of the hemisphere <laughs> is, is engaged with these questions in, in some in some way or the other. Um, so, uh, you know, we're an, we're a big outlier, <laughs> but we we are in in, in many ways. Um, so, in any case, uh, listen, I, I want to thank all of you guys for for coming out. Uh, um, this means a lot for me as, as I help as I try to refine these concepts uh, for the final for the final piece um, of work that that this project will produce. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you so much.